Okay, uh, good morning. Good morning to everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Um, this is the, the new talk of the, uh, this is a new impact talk of the uh, 2022 se seminar series of the Magnetic Resonance Laboratory. In this opportunity, we have a, an invited talk from, from France that uh, will, will be given by Rafael Lopez Seeger. Rafael um, did his uh, bachelor and his master, obtained his bachelor and his master degrees in physics at the Universidad Federal de Santa Maria uh, in the laboratory of magnetism and magnetic materials. He also obtained his PhD in 2021 from the Université Grenoble Alpes uh, in Spintec. And now he's um, about to start a postdoc position in the SPEC laboratory in SEVA uh, uh, in Paris, exactly. The title of, of his talk is The Tram Transport Mechanism in Ferromagnetic and Anti-Ferromagnetic Spin Structure and Spin Texture. He's going to share with us uh, some of the things that he developed during the, his PhD thesis. So, um, Rafael, go ahead. You can share your screen now. Okay, thanks. I imagine you already can see my, my screen, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Luis, for your kind introduction and for the opportunity to, to present a bit of the work I was involved during my PhD uh, at SpinTech. So at SpinTech, I was working in the Antiferromagnetic Spintronics group uh, that's led by Van Sandbach. And I invite you all to, to visit the group webpage that you can find here so that you can see all the different research projects from, from the group uh, there at SpinTech. So this is the outline of my presentation today. I will uh, start with an introduction on the specificities of the spin uh, dependent transport in antiferromagnets. Then I will move on to a summary showing two different uh, uh, independent projects. And I will finish with a conclusion. So Spintronics utilizes the spin degree of freedom of electrons to create uh, novel devices with increased uh, memory and processing capabilities. And ferromagnets, they have been extensively used in Spintronics mainly because of the remanent state of the magnetization, which is uh, beneficial for non-volatile devices, and uh, also because of the possibility of switching it in hundreds of picoseconds. And this uh, fast switching allows, of course, fast devices to, to, to operate. Then concerning uh, magnetoresistive effects, ferromagnets might display a large electrical response, uh, and this electrical response is, is in general associated with the magnetization. And of course, uh, very often, in spintronics, the discovery of new uh, magnetoresistive effects led to, to applications. And be beyond uh, magnetoresistive effects, the interaction of uh, physical entities such as light, uh, heat, and electricity with spins in ferromagnets have attracted a lot of interest, in, uh, so they have been extensively studied. But of course, uh, ferromagnet-based devices also offer some limiting factors in terms of uh, performance, so such as uh, instability due to spurious magnetic fields, the, the limits to high storage density due to the magnetic field crosstalks between the devices, and also the dynamics in the giga gigahertz range that limits the, the maximum velocity of switching. So aiming to, to overcome uh, some of these drawbacks of ferromagnets, uh, so res researchers recently have turned their attention toward uh, alternative structures. And one of the possibilities consists in using antiferromagnets for, for spintronics. And considering antiferromagnets, and ferromagnets, there are several specificities uh, due to the presence of two opposed spin uh, sublattices. So in, in this case, the net magnetization is expressed uh, uh, globally, macroscopically, 
and it can be measured in a direct way by a usually various bar uh, net magnetization, and uh, the nail uh, vector is expressed locally. And this interplay between uh, local and global properties open uh, spaces space for new physics. So in initially, uh, let's say conventional antiferromagnets, uh, they were expected to display a, a very small electrical response because of this small of their small net magnetization. But uh, recently, it it uh, due to the new microscopic mechanism, they have shown that actually a large electrical response is possible even with a, a small net magnetization. And of course, uh, the interaction of physical entities, as I mentioned before. Uh, with spins in antiferromagnets is now uh, in, under current investigation and they rely in, in different mechanisms than co when compared to ferromagnets. And maybe uh, just to mention some of the poss possible uh, advantages uh, by using antiferromagnets for spintronics, uh, you, you can expect a stability to external magnetic field as uh, an antiferromagnet can only be manipulated by uh, a large magnetic field. We, you can also enhance, you can also possibly have a higher density in the, in the memory devices because you, you have uh, no uh, crosstalk uh, between the devices due to the zero net magnetization in antiferromagnets. Uh, due to the, you, you can also have faster dynamics due to the fact that the dynamics in antiferromagnets is intrinsically in the terahertz range. Um, additional, in addition to this, there are other physical mechanisms that are unique to, to antiferromagnets and they just begin to, to be explored. So with this perspective of uh, spin-dependent transport in mind, so antiferromagnets, they present a wide variety of properties as shown here. And this really opens uh, multiple options for studying spin transport. So I will mention here uh, two materials that I was uh, mostly studying during my PhD uh, that are uh, uh, particularly uh, iridium manganese uh, because it has a large uh, high book now temperature and also because it has a large spin hole angle, and this other metallic compound, which is manganese 5 silicon 3, because this material presents two uh, distinct magnetic phases with collinear and non coplanar spin structures depending on the, the temperature. So, firstly, I will discuss uh, the results involving uh, charge char transport applied specifically to magnetic spin textures. So particularly, uh, I will discuss the, the results from this work here, uh, where we have used a uh, proximity effect to study the Cooper pair characteristic length in the Erdida manganese. So I start with a, a short introduction to proximity effect in superconductors. So basically, uh, a Cooper pair consists of a pair of uh, electrons that are, and they have opposite spins. So when discussing uh, proximity effects, the, characteri the characteristic length uh, here is the coherence length of Cooper pairs and it characterizes how, uh, how deep the superconducting correlations are induced in the neighbor material. So when the, the material in contact with the superconductor is a, is a metal, basically the proximity effect weakens superconductivity because you have a lack of paired electrons that diffuses towards the, the, the metallic adjacent layer. For, for, for this reason, you have a loss in the, in the critical temperature of the superconductor. But a different situation may uh, happen when the adjacent material is a ferromagnet. For example, uh, if the, the ferromagnet the adjacent uh, material is a ferromagnet and it is, saturate, it is in its saturated state, uh, one would expect suppression of superconductivity because the Cooper pairs, they experience a uh, homogeneous exchange field from the bottom uh, ferromagnet and it results in Cooper pair breaking and uh, it, it results in a decrease in loss of the critical temperature compared to the case where the, we, have, we have a bare superconductor. And, but on the other hand, 
if the, the ferromagnet is set to a demag demagnetized state, this suppression uh, of superconductivity might be alleviated because uh, in this case, a Cooper pair simultaneous, simultaneously samples uh, different uh, direction of the exchange field and it reduces the average uh, exchange field sensed by the Cooper pair. So it results, uh, as a consequence of this effect, it results in a partial, re partial recovery of the critical temperature. So uh, here I show one a typical resistance versus temperature uh, curve, and it shows the variation in, in the critical temperature depending on the state of a adjacent ferromagnet layer. And it shows that Tc is larger uh, when the ferromagnet is set to a multi-domain state compared to, to, the, to the saturator of a single domain state, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So in order to observe this effect, uh, one needs to adjust several parameters, uh, such as the superconducting coherence length uh, with respect to the domain and domain all sizes, for example. So just to give uh, a picture uh, what why these, these, these parameters matter, Imagine if you have a domain, domain size that's much larger than the superconducting coherence length. So in this case, on average, the Cooper pair will, uh, will sense a homogeneous exchange field and no recovery in TC is observed because it looks like it's a saturated uh, ferromagnet. So uh, for, for these reasons, for multilayer, in, in, in the literature for multilayers with out-of-plane anisotropy, a maximum recovery of 0.6% uh, have been observed, and it prevents uh, two investigations that we were interested in, in pursuing. So the first one is the influence of the magnet configuration, and, uh, and what happens when uh, uh, we insert an interlayer between the, the superconductor and the, and the ferromagnet layer. When we, we when we insert, for example, an antiferromagnet between these two these two materials. So, uh, as a uh, as a first step in our project, then we have prepared a platinum cobalt uh, multilayers, and we have used niobium nitride as superconductor, and we use uh, iridium manganese as a spacer. Uh, in, in general, the iridium manganese layer here is very thin for this initial. Uh, for these initial studies. So for the transport, we prepared the this stack in, in form of this kind of hall bars from where we can use, for example, electrodes V1 and V2 to measure the, the stack resistance, but we can also use the transversal electrodes V1 and V3 to monitor the magnetization of the platinum cobalt multilayer due to, due to the anomalous hard effect. So, Maybe, uh, yes, of course, I, I must also mention that we have used this kind of uh, sample holders. So we have a on-ship uh, thermometer. So it, it allows us to measure very precisely the sample temperature. So after this, we uh, applied uh, some few sequences to produce different magnetic states for the platinum cobalt uh, bottom ferromagnet. For example, here, uh, the, the, these two symbols, they can be uh, accessed. So we, have, we can access a demagnetized state and a saturated state with the same 0.5 kilohertz remanence, uh, remanence field. So it's the, and these two states are the states that we measured the superconducting critical temperature. So, now I show here on the right the super the resistance versus temperature sweeps. So in order to, de to determine the critical temperature of the the, the superconductor, so we, we measure the the resistance of the whole stack, and we can see directly from 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 here that uh, when the ferromagnet layer is demagnetized, we have a larger TC. And um, again, these results confirm that the presence of domain walls in the demagnetized platinum cobalt led to weaker Cooper pair uh, breaking. So uh, remarkably, uh, we have observed here a uh, uh, temperature recovery of around 
which is a tenfold improvement compared to literature. And we attribute this enhancement to, to define adjustment between the coherence length in the enabling right, right and the domain and domain wall sizes in the in the uh, ferromagnetic layer. So for the, for these thicknesses, we have the the superconducting coherence length in the nitride and the thickness of the domain wall in the order of 15 uh, nanometers. So uh, it opened the, the for us the possibility of doing different uh, experimental and also theoretical investigations, and as I will show in the next uh, few slides. So we have, uh, I will comment now on the, the influence of the thickness of the enable nitride superconductor on the recovery of TC in your, uh, in your boot layers. And this data, this data here presents the variation in TC assumption of the thickness and the fact that if the case when the thickness increases, in the case it suggests actually an interfacial nature uh, of the effect. And we, we have measured the, the thickness dependence of some superconducting properties. And this, uh, this variation of uh, the superconducting coherence length and the, of TC at zero field, uh, they are known to be uh, related with finite size effect that takes into account a weakened interfacial superconductivity. So, but most importantly, we use uh, this data uh, of the superconducting coherence length to plot this uh, graph here that shows that uh, the, the recovering the critical temperature assumption of the ratio between the superconducting coherence length and the thickness of the enable nitride. And the fact that we have a linear relationship here uh, further supports that, uh, that, that we have uh, an interfacial nature of the proximity effect uh, involved here. Um, then finally, we were interested, as I mentioned before, in studying the impact of gradual changing the ferromagnet state. So we have here in the right, uh, completely demagnetized state, and here in the left, uh, uh, saturated state. And the intermediate configurations might be obtained by using this kind of uh, uh, field cycling, as illustrated uh, uh, here. So the plotted here basically shows that uh, how the, the magnetic domain arrangements in the platinum cobalt ferromagnet influence superconductivity, uh, the superconductivity recovery in enabling nitride. So we observe that gradually reducing the domain size from the saturated state to uh, the diamond state we uh, progressively recover the superconductivity from zero to 10%. Uh, we considered uh, also if the superconductivity uh, the recovery was affected by the thickness of the platinum cobalt. So we, here we have different number of repetitions of the platinum cobalt uh, multilayer. And it shows that again, gradually by gradually increasing uh, we, we have this gradual increase of uh, delta of the temperature recovery as the magnetic domain configurations goes from the saturated states to the fully uh, demagnetized states. So th these lines here, uh, they were calculated based on a quasi-classical diffusive model that was uh, developed by our uh, collaborators. So. The model basically considers that, uh, that the Cooper pair fuse a uniform uh, reduced effective, effective exchange field due to regular uh, stripe domains. And it follows uh, qualitatively well our, our experimental data. We have a more deviation here close to, to the saturation where of course the domain structure uh, is very different from, from periodic stripe domains. Uh, then we investigated uh, what's the influence of the spacer thickness on the recovery of the critical temperature. So we see here, we, we took advantage actually of the proximity effect in our uh, uh, ether structures to study how deep the Cooper pair uh, propagates in iridium manganese uh, when you use iridium manganese as a spacer. So by doing this, we can probe 
the penetration depth of Cooper pairs in, in, in any metallic spacer layers. So by fitting this data, we obtained a coherence length of approximately seven nanometers for iridium manganese. And as a comparison, we have obtained something in the order of 12 nanometers for, for platinum. Uh, before moving, uh, just to mention a few more words on how this uh, is done, how these experiments are, are done. Basically, uh, every point here uh, corresponds to one thickness of the antiferromagnet, and it was uh, obtained by a self-consistent method. So, and also this uh, exponential decay is expected from quasi-classical quasi -classical theories uh, considering the, the diffusive model. The diffusive limit, sorry. And then we move to consider whether the domain state in the antiferromagnetic layer influences uh, superconductivity. So we use a, a domain replication approach to stabilize several states at the iridium manganese uh, layer at low temperature. And then uh, by after this stabilization, we obtain hysteresis loops uh, as shown here, the first hysteresis loop, that for in which case that the shift along the field axis depends on the magnetic state of the iridium manganese layer. So in, here in the right, I show that the again that the recovery in the critical temperature as a function of the magnet configuration of the platinum cobalt ferromagnet for different states of the antiferromagnet. So we can see that it's uh, in this case, the magnet state of the antiferromagnet anti magnet doesn't matter for, for a Cooper pair transport. Uh, so we have also considered uh, the critical current enhancement. So basically the critical current is the maximum uh, electrical current that a superconductor is able to maintain without resistance. So using the same field cycling as before, we prepare the ferromagnet layer in the demagnetized unsaturated state. And then we measure the, the critical current by ramping from low current values to high values. And for us, a given current value, there is a jump from the superconductor state to the normal state here in, in the top. So these oscillations in the voltage here, they are ascribed to back and forth, uh, back and forth normal to superconducting uh, transition. And the, the right figure here, uh, uh, indicates that indeed the measurement is perturbed by uh, thermal fluctuations that follow the, the oscillations in, in voltage. So in order to do some analysis, we have taken the val value for IC where the first oscillation is, is observed. And on, on the, as expected from the critical temperature measurements, the critical current in this case is larger for the case of the demagnetized state compared to the saturated one. So it's known that uh, the critical current value is a temperature dependent uh, parameter and that it uh, IC increases when the TC is reduced. Hello. 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 I missed the presentation. Yes, uh, I was kicked for a while. I missed the presentation. Okay, no problem. Let me start uh, presenting again. Let's see. Yeah.
Do you see my screen again? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, I don't know from which slide. Uh, 14. It has 14. It stopped in 14 for you also. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry for, for this, but uh, I don't know what happened. Okay. So I was mentioning that uh, the critical current uh, is known to be temperature dependent. So an IC increases when the temperature is reduced from TC, uh, so IC increases. And it's possible to calculate the specter, expected temperature dependence by fitting uh, with this curve, and it returns the value of TC at zero uh, current and IC at zero uh, temperature. So, uh, so just before concluding this section in magnetic spin textures, I, might, I may mention this study that we have also done uh, in the search of uh, skinons in on the rhythm manganese. So we were employing an uh, impression uh, approach and we optimized these stacks for performing pin uh, experiments. And we were able to measure uh, so, some spin textures within the region manganese layer here, and the signal was coming from the uncompensated manganese uh, spins. So you can find more of this uh, in this uh, work, recent work here. And besides the results that I, I have shown, uh, and also as a perspective in this project, there are some attempts to study proximity effect in, in a nice ferromagnetic insulator close to a superconductor, and also to do some NEV center magnetometry experiments to directly observe the imprinted textures uh, in early the manganese. Okay, so in the past slides, uh, we were discussing uh, spin textures, which basically is a uh, inhomogeneity in the spin structure. We will now uh, go for charge transport is specific to spin structure uh, itself. So we have studied the magnetic transport in epitaxial thin films of mangan manganese 5 silicon tree. And this project, I, I must, must mention, that is part of a large collaboration between several institutions uh, in France, uh, in Germany, and also in, in Czech Republic. So I start by remembering uh, that historically, the Hall resistivity was considered to have two terms, the ordinary Hall, which is proportional to the applied magnetic field, and where the Lorentz force that is responsible for uh, curving the electron path, and the anomalous Hall effect, which is proportional to the magnetization. And for a long time, it was believed that the Hall resistivity was only proportional to MZ and on top of the applied magnetic field. And okay, and the anomalous how contribution here coming from uh, uh, from a ferromagnet needs spin orbit interaction, and it has a uh, extrinsic and intrinsic origin. Concerning the intrinsic origin, uh, it's related to the band structure, and was uh, described in terms of the the Berry curvature. And the Berry curvature itself, as shown here in this uh, in this equation, uh, is is proportional to the intrinsic contribution to the anomalous Hall conductivity. And uh, in order to have a non-zero Berry curvature, one needs to break specific symmetry. For instance, here in the case of anomalous Hall effect in a ferrule magnets, it's the, the out-of-plane component of the magnetization that breaks time reversal symmetry. So from this point of view of symmetry breaking, uh, it was believed that in anti-ferrule magnets, know how uh, contribution uh, would be observed due to the zero net magnetization. But in fact, uh, recent developments uh, have shown that actually uh, you can break time reversal symmetry in non-collinear uh, and non-coplanar also antiferro magnets, even when they uh, have zero net magnetization. And it also can happen in collinear uh, antiferro magnets due to the uh, anisotropy in, magnet, in magnetization uh, densities. So in our work, we have uh, introduced a new time reversal symmetry breaking mechanism 
that takes place in a collinear uh, antiferromagnet. And uh, it comes from the interplay between uh, antiferromagnetism and crystal symmetries. So in order to, we, we have demonstrated then this effect by measuring uh, a spontaneous Hall uh, effect in manganese 5 silicon free. So for our experiments, we have grown epoxial layers of manganese 5 silicon free on top of silicon um, substrates. The, the epoxial layers are grown uh, by MBE. Here I show a TEM image of, uh, of the, the fumes. And this is the orientation of the, of the fumes on top of the silicon substrate. And the unit cell orientation was confirmed also by XRD uh, experiments. So to perform magnetotransport in this kind of epi layers, we have prepared hull bars. So from which we can measure simultaneously the longitudinal and transversal uh, resistivities. Then from the temperature dependence of the longitudinal resistivity that's shown here in, in the top, we identify two antiferromagnet phases. So we have a collinear and of course coplanar phase that uh, takes place between approximately 70 Kelvin and 240 Kelvin. And then we have a low temperature phase, which is uh, a non-coplanar uh, phase below 70 Kelvin. So we, uh, comparing to, to the literature, we have observed a significant enhancement in the higher nail temperature in our fumes, uh, comparing to book samples from, from, from the literature. So we attribute this difference from strain in our, in our epi layers that can stabilize the antiferromagnet order up to, to higher temperatures. And I highlight also that this strain is key for the observation of the effect that we observe here, because this preserves the right combination of crystalline and spin symmetries. So you can see here now the raw data from the transversal resistivity. I show again the color code for the non coplanar and the collinear phases. So directly, one observes uh, a spontaneous Hall contribution in a large temperature range. And for, from the literature, one would expect only uh, a topological Hall contribution in the non-coplanar phase, in the, so in, only in this low temperature uh, phase. So here we detect a spontaneous Hall signal that persists in the collinear phase, and it vanishes only above 240 Kelvin. And it also confirms that we have some magnetic ordering, ordering up to this uh, temperature. So I will take the data of 50 Kelvin as, uh, as an example to show how to, we can separate the different contributions because at this, uh, at this low temperature, we would expect some topological how contribution. So here in, the, in, in dark blue, we have our raw data. And we separate it in two contributions. So in the light blue, we have the, the typical bump-like feature, the typical bump-like feature from the topological Hall effect. And what's remaining here in red is the, the contribution that we are calling, calling here uh, uh, due to the uh, antiferromagnet Zeeman effect. And I will explain it uh, in, the, in the next few slides. So by decomposing uh, the, these two contributions, uh, we plot this kind of course here from where we can see that the antiferromagnetic Zeeman contribution here in red dominates in the entire uh, temperature range. And as expected, there is a topological high effect only in the low temperature phase as expected also from, from, from the literature. And we have also checked it, check it, the spontaneous house signal for, for these layers by comparing samples with different uh, quality. So, and for all the samples, we observe the same trend, which is a, a non-zero spontaneous house signal that vanishes above 240 Kelvin. And uh, it's in, in this order of, uh, the conductivities are in this order of magnitude. So 
if we plot now uh, different uh, different samples with varying, varying qualities, we observe that uh, they have different how, uh, resistivity. So here I show the raw resistivity taken at 150 Kelvin as a function of the ratio between the manganese 5 and manganese silicon uh, phases. So this uh, indicates the, the, the quality of the fumes. The higher is the ratio, the better is the quality of the fume. And you see that the higher, the, the, that higher uh, quality corresponds to a higher how resistivity. And just to mention that we have performed also uh, extensive magnetometry measurements in the samples, and it shows uh, uh, a very small uh, remanence magnetization that cannot explain the how resistivity that I have shown in the previous slide. And I emphasize that we don't have any feature close to the high uh, coercivities that we have observed in the how resistivity. And also that, uh, that the magnetization uh, does not depend on the, on the crystal quality. So to do a, a half estimation, if we consider the empirical equation for the how contribution and put the MZ value that we have here, uh, we would expect a how uh, signal approximately six order of magnitudes is smaller than what we got uh, experimentally. And it, therefore, it also supports that we have another, uh, that the how contribution that we are measuring have, uh, uh, comes from another origin. Then finally, our theoretician colleagues, they developed a model to explain our results. So if they consider our manganese 5 silicon free uh, material, they calculate the energy bands. And I show here the energy bands without and with spin of interaction. And it confirms that it has its specific kind of spin splitting that we call uh, antiferromagnetic anti Zeeman spin splitting, where the spin splitting is opposed around the two magnetic valleys. And for the case, uh, and this is, is at the origin of a non-zero Berry curvature because it breaks uh, time reversal symmetry in the case of, uh, only in the case of the checkerboard border, board ordering. So um, here in the right, we see the Berry curvature calculations. So as I mentioned before, it's uh, related to the increased contribution to the anomalous how conductivity. And from the calculations, uh, we get, uh, we have obtained how conductivities in the same order of magnitudes from the ones that we have obtained uh, experimentally. So, uh, so as a conclusion here, uh, okay, as a perspective in this study, actually, uh, we believe that this uh, effect might be uh, useful for the re realization of the antiferromagnetic analogs of GMR and TMR. Also, there is uh, a lot to be understood concerning the anisotropy effect on the anomalous high effect and concerning how the, the magnetization reversal happens in this case, and also to do some magnetic thermoelectric experiments uh, because uh, the spontaneous how uh, the anomalous high effect and the anomalous nerve effect they share the same symmetries, so we would expect some anomalous nerve uh, signal from from the samples as well. And finally, as a conclusion, so I have shown uh, some results dealing with chart transport applied to spin textures and also spin structures. And I just say a few words about uh, other works I was involved at SpinTech during my PhD, which were dealing with spin transport and spin shear conversion in ferro and antiferro magnets. So uh, yes, we were studying uh, the effect of spin fluctuations on the spin transport and the spin shear conversion. And also there, there was some work studying the spin shear conversion comparing the, the characteristic lengths in the gigahertz and terahertz range, as you can see in this uh, recent work as well. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, uh, I can try to answer some of your questions. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael, for the interesting talk. Uh,
Now I, I would like to open the, the, the session to, to questions. I do have a, a couple of questions, uh, but if someone else wants to start, uh, you can raise your virtual hand or write in the chat as you want. Okay, Javier, go ahead. Okay, hello. Thank you, Rafael, for this talk. It was very funny for me. Just, I have a question. In slide number nine, or maybe eight, something like that, you talk about the characteristics length, length which are involved in the phenomenology of the change in the critical current and the TC of the superconductor. And you talk about the domain wall width. Yes. And I, I don't understand why the relevant length is the domain wall width and not the domain wall, the domain width, the, the domain size. Because after that, you show that change in the size of the domain, you, you change the, this delta TC. But I don't, I don't understand really which is the role of the domain, <clears throat> the domain wall width. Okay, so both play, play a role. So as I mentioned before, okay, if you have a domain that is super large compared to the Cooper pair Cohen's length, so imagine that they, they are larger than the Cooper pair Cohen's length, so the, the, the Cooper pair will rest in a region where the exchange field is homogeneous, so it will promote Cooper pair breaking. But in the other side, if the, the Cooper pair Cohen's length is much smaller or much larger than the domain wall width, so uh, if the domain wall width is close to the Cooper pair Cohen's length, they are happy to be one at each side of the domain. So it stabilizes the, the Cooper pair. So you have to play with both uh, quantities. Okay, but when you change uh, in the next slide, when you change the the state of the yes, the, the the state of the sample, you just change, just only change the domain size and not the domain walls width. No, then but, all these. But, okay, but this we have. Uh, of course, uh, we have uh, normalized this, this data, you see, just to, to be able to compare them. Otherwise, uh, the, the, of course, due to the, the variation in the domain sizes, the, the delta TC here, they are different. So it also varies with the domain size. Okay, okay, thank you. I show uh, in the in this uh, let me see where in this reference here uh, we show this data that you are asking for. We we have measured the, the dependence of uh, the size of the domain assumption of the number of repetitions, and then compared to this data. Okay, I will see. Thank you. Yeah, but I think uh, Javier is referring to the domain wall size. Uh, so. Uh, but here, here the domain wall size doesn't change much. It doesn't change by changing the number of repetitions, but the domain no. size changed. Yes. Okay. Is there any other question? Okay, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, okay, Laura, go ahead. No, sorry, I have my microphone off. Uh, First of all, thank you for your nice talk, really. I'm in, I have a question about the topological Hall effect. The, in fact, the temperature dependence of this. In fact, I, I find that the anomalous Hall effect, the, the temperature dependence is rather usual. It's the classical dependence, but the, this peak in the topological Hall effect, how do you explain this, uh, the origin of this behavior? Uh, well, actually, we... We have put this here, have but, it, but you see that uh, the, the okay. shape of the, so, yeah, the shape of the curve here at uh, 10 Kelvin, it's already difficult to separate the contributions. So uh, I wouldn't uh, be very uh, confident that this is uh, this is 100% uh, correct, you know, because it's uh, very tricky to separate the contributions. Yes, in this I case. see. Yeah. Uh, okay. So you are not sure that you are having a peak there. It's Rather strange to happen. Yeah, I would say that maybe it can follow, keep increasing or. Yeah. Or, okay. Okay. But this this data this data here in zero is not uh, one hundred percent correct. At okay. rate, I would say. Okay. I see. Thank you. 
Is there any other question? I can proceed with mine. Um, you mentioned that when you change the, the thickness of the superconductor in, in the first part of, the, of your talk, you also changed, uh, you, you said that this is a, an interfacial effect due to that. But yeah. have you considered the change of the superconducting temperature as a function of the thickness itself of the niobium uh, nitride? Uh, but actually, uh, all the others, uh, I'm not sure I understood, but all the others' uh, conclusions, they are taken based on variation in the critical temperature. So this parameter delta Tc over Tc and not, that, uh, not Tc itself. Okay. So that's why any uh, variation from Tc here doesn't matter for us because we are measuring variation we are measuring delta C and not T C. Okay. Okay. Okay, I see it now. Yeah. I skip that. Okay. Thanks. And um, in thank you. In the second part of the talk, I suppose uh, for future studies, you expect uh, to have some uh, an anisotropic resistivity, right? Because in that, for example, you show the the, the whole bar. In just a, a, a yes, you are, you are putting um, the different axes there. Uh, is that the only yeah. direction you, you measure the, you, the the resistivity? You do not uh, rotate the whole bar, for example. The, yes, there are some attempts now uh, in doing, uh, of course, uh, rotations of the magnetic fields, and also. Uh, uh, preparing how bars in different directions with respect to the, the crystal axis to see if there is any difference in, in the, the signal. Okay. But this is ongoing work from the from a new PhD student. Okay, I understand. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I have another question, but Carlos, go ahead. Hello, Rafael. Thank you for your talk. And at the very beginning of your talk, you mentioned why uh, the um, proximity effect to a ferromagnet uh, increases TC, which is opposite to what uh, the little I learned about superconductivity. If you repeat, why is, why is that? Ah, OK. Uh, OK, in this case, actually, the, the TC for the bare superconductor always will be larger. So when you have a saturated, there will be a decrease in the critical temperature. And when you have the magnetized state, you slightly recover it, see, but it's not larger than, than the bare, so bare superconductor. It's a in enhancement compared to the saturated state, but it's never higher than the bare superconductor. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I, ha I think I have a last question. In, in slide 12, you mentioned that for the data, or I think it was for, for the simulation, you use a self-consistent method. Could you please explain a little bit more? I, I'm not, uh, I don't know about that. For, for, for this uh, data, you see? Yes, uh, it's just that uh, for so for each each data point here, we, we have taken uh, one thickness of the radial manganese, and then we measure the we, we measure TC at when the ferromagnet is set to the saturated state, and we measure TC when it's demagnetized. So we measure we obtain this delta TC over TC. So that's the self-consistent because we measure in the same sample. We don't need to, for example, if you, uh, for, for each data point, it's in the same sample. That's the, my point. Okay. It's not, um, because other, otherwise you could plot TC as function of thickness, but then TC would be very dependent on interface sample, uh, slightly variations in the temperature, but when you measure delta Tc over Tc, it's much more uh, robust about these uh, small differences. Okay. 
Okay, Rafael, that's all from my side. I think um, I, enjoy, I enjoy your talk. If there is no more questions, um, I would like to thank you again for sharing your work with us. Um, you're welcome to, to share it whenever you want. Um, okay, with that, okay. I conclude this yep. seminar, the seminar of this week. Um, see you next week. The next week, um, we will have a talk of Clever Pirota from Unicamp. Um, looking forward to, to see you there too. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here and goodbye. Bye bye.